as John uh, mentioned, I'll be talking about stochastic simulations of varied gene expression models within minimal bacteria. Um, and so to kind of begin, uh, we need to talk about this idea of stochastic gene, or I'm sorry, not stochastic, uh, stoichiometric gene expression. And so what this kind of idea is, is that uh, the expression ratios or the stoichiometries between proteins and the species expressed in the cell um, are, the ratios are very important. Uh, they're important within complexes that you're seeing uh, in this transporter example, as well as in this uh, multimeric protein, but as well as they're important within networks. So I have an example um, region of the nucleotide metabolism where each of these reactions are catalyzed by a protein and if these proteins themselves are out of um, the proper ratios, you can get fluxes going in the wrong direction or have uh, fatal events to the cell. And so the general kind of question um, that I've been trying to ask or what I'm hopefully going to um, maybe answer to some extent, but uh, more so provide some ongoing work to try and answer this question is how do cells achieve and maintain this proper protein stoichiometries? Um, and so how do we even go about doing this? So in our group, uh, you might be familiar with, we use uh, whole cell models to try and understand cellular life. And so the general idea of the whole cell model can be thought of as a way to predict or describe the state of the cell. How you describe the state of the cell is kind of up to the model. But in the model that I'll be talking about, um, you really need to kind of think of it in terms of three major components. Um, I have over here the graphical abstract from uh, the cell paper that we recently published where we published the Syn3A um, whole cell model. Um, but what I really kind of want you to take away from it is more of these three terms of composition, interactions, and propagation. Um, so in my case, the composition, I will be accounting for the genome, proteome, transcriptome within um, Syn3A. Uh, for the interactions in the cell paper, we focused on metabolism and genetic information processing. I'll be focusing just on genetic information processing at this point. Metabolism is indirectly accounted for um, through the kinetic rates but I am not updating those kinetic rates or I'm not actually simulating any metabolism. And as I have there, the rates forms are generated based in the same way um, that we did in the cell paper. However, within that work, if you're familiar with it, we had a proxy promoter strength to try and determine how um, frequently a gene should maybe be read. I've gone away with that. And instead, I'll kind of explain what I'm doing um, instead of that uh, later. But basically, I'm changing the, the list of events that can occur rather than um, modifying the probabilities of binding, let's say. Um, and then the last case, which I won't really talk about too much given the time is the propagation. And in this case, it'll be a well-stirred simulation, meaning all species can interact with each other. Uh, we call that the chemical master equation. Um, but as I also mentioned, the idea is I'll be doing this all in sin 3 a um, And so, uh, I talked about the idea of the composition, interactions, and propagation. What I find the most interesting uh, component of those three is the interactions. It's telling you how the species are interacting with each other, where those interactions are potentially occurring. You can just think of that purely as the reactions. And so as I have here, um, interactions, ooh, uh, don't know what just happened. Is it slides back up? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so interactions within the bacterial within bacterial gene expression are multifaceted. And what I mean by that is I have uh, this picture up here of what you can probably see as the central dogma, but I have some other kind of factors that are um, taken into account. And so what I'll kind of start on the left here is that you have some genome architecture, which are the motifs that are on the DNA itself. Um, those are dictating the events that can actually occur. Then you have some physical interaction with the RNA polymerase where you have transcription. But what's interesting is that just a single transcription event is not deterministic. Uh, the, re the process is stochastic. And what that can kind of mean I have in that top left there is an identical event. So an event that begins maybe at the same gene, this can have a different outcome. And what that evolves is RNA isoforms. So what I have here is this region of the genome can be transcribed and depending on how the transcription event progresses, you can get a RNA isoform that encodes different amounts of information. And I'm dictating that by the color of the transcript or the RNA isoform. Additionally, those RNA can go through other processes. Uh, an example of that will be cleavage, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and then those RNA isoforms can also be decayed by the degradosome. 
And then more importantly, they can be differentially translated. And so what that is just kind of meaning is that, again, different transcripts, even if they have the same information, or in the case of these uh, top two where they're both encoding uh, the orange and blue gene, depending on how they interact with the ribosome, you can actually get different amounts of proteins that end up being evolved. Um, and so what I'm mostly going to focus on is kind of the transcription side of things. I'll talk a little bit about post-transcriptional, but um, for the brevity of the talk, I will only kind of be focusing on transcription explicitly. And so to modify or modify, to uh, simulate the uh, transcription, you need a set of interactions. And so I mentioned the idea of uh, we use a proxy promoter strength to modify um, the kinetics within transcription within the whole cell model of the cell uh, paper in 2020, uh, Thornburg et al. Um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm dic I am dictating the transcription events based on allowing for single gene expression on the left here um, and co-expression on the right. And so the way that's determined is uh, in some previous work, and I'm not really going to touch on it too much here, but we did some transcriptomics and I additionally did some computational predictions of the different motifs within um, Syn3A. And so what I'm showing here is that you can actually then determine the promoters, determine the termination loops and kind of outline the transcription events. So in this single gene case, you have three transcription events that would evolve each of the three genes individually. In the co-expression case, all three of these genes would be expressed at the same time. Uh, think of like an operon. Um, so what I'm now showing are the reactions. The reactions for the single gene case are pretty obvious. It's just the DNA bond, or RNA polymerase binds to the gene. You have your transcription event. That messenger can then be translated and also degraded. And what you'll notice is that the identity of the messenger is always corresponding to that specific gene. Um, in the case of the co-expression is where it gets a little bit more complicated is now what you have is a binding event that only occurs at uh, the transcription start site for gene A. And what you end up evolving out of this is what I'm just describing as an RNA TU. And so in this case, that would be a, a messenger that encodes all of the information in of genes A, B, and C. Translation then happens a little bit differently in the kinematic model now because you need to evolve each of the proteins. So what I do here is have kind of a hopping between states. Um, as I mentioned before, this is all ongoing, so this could potentially not be the best way to handle translation in this case. Um, but for this presentation, the way I'm currently doing, I'm handling translation by going through these intermediate states. And then degradation, you just have that um, TU be able to degrade uh, via the degradosome. Now, um, before I kind of move on, I guess I should quickly touch on the idea of the post transcript, or I'm sorry, post trans, yeah, post transcriptional um, processes. And so in this case, I didn't really do too much post transcriptional. The major thing that I've done is translation and trans, um, an mRNA decay, but I'm not really modifying that in any way. So there are inherent issues with it. But what I did uh, end up doing is I added in cleavage. And so why I added in cleavage is um, there was some transcriptomic data that I alluded to where we did Oxford nanopore, which gets long read sequences of um, the messengers within a cell. And so what we're able to do with that is actually look at how complete the transcripts are. And so what I'm showing in this figure at the bottom here is if I had those genes A, B, and C, I can have transcripts that were determined or measured by the experiment, but they are not complete. And what I mean by complete here is that they have all of the coding information for the genes that they are assigned to. So if you notice here, the blue one is the only one that goes the full length of all three genes. So if a ribosome were to translate this uh, messenger, it would be able to make all three of these proteins, whereas these other two, they are missing some information. The most interesting thing and why, again, post-transcriptional um, modification or post-transcriptional processes, I should say, were added slightly was because of this um, kind of result that we got where only around 15 percent of the total transcripts observed in the experiment are actually full length. So they have all of the uh, genetic information for what they're determined to code for. Um, this has been observed in E. coli. And so why I find this kind of interesting is it kind of alludes to um, there being most of the transcripts have been processed in some way, whether it be cleavage, degradation, or maybe an interrupted transcription event or something like that. But there's some process in 
tra post transcriptionally that is uh, modifying the transcripts where they do not have all of their genetic information. And so how I handle that in the model to go over it, um, it's pretty simple. Is just I cleave based on the identity of a transcript or uh, the identity of the genes within a transcript. So we have three kind of cases here. In this first case, where all of the um, genes are mRNA, no cleavage occurs. This would just go to the ribosome, to grotosome. Um, in the case where all of the transcripts, or all of the genes, I'm sorry, in a transcript are non-mRNA, I cleave them indivi um, individually into individual genes, and then they're added to the total pool of whatever uh, non-mRNA they are. So that could be tRNA, rRNA, for example. And then, the kind of intermediate between the two examples is if you have a heterogeneous uh, transcription unit where there are genes of multiple identities, I cleave according um, to the same kind of methods above, but I make it so that all of the RNA, uh, or I'm sorry, all of the mRNA are kept together and then all of the um, non-mRNA are cleaved into individual units. Um, so if, for example, there was a uh, mRNA on the other side of this, which would be like gene D, that would be cleaved into an individual um, transcript only encoding gene D. Uh, and so now kind of with the model somewhat laid out or how I'm handling this, we can kind of go on to some results. Some of this is a little bit pre preliminary, but what I really want to just highlight is the impact of the transcription unit architecture. So what I have here, and I'll show some data on the next slide actually plotted out, but I think this is kind of easy enough to see in a table form is that based on um, the parameters that I'm using, I can see different observable outputs. Uh, basically, I see different cell states or different computational omics. In this case, I'm looking mostly at the transcriptomics uh, computationally in terms of how many messengers are at, achieved at the steady state um, of the simulation. And so the parameters, just quickly going through them, is this is the active fraction of RNA polymerase. Uh, Due to the length of the talk, I don't have enough time to go into it, but the way or why I'm using this is I'm determining the K on based on this uh, expression you see here, where if you assume equilibrium, you can actually solve for what the K on should be determined by the active fraction of RNA polymerase. The reason I did this is to make the um, simulations more comparable because of the different um, architectures. There's different number of genes you'll see, different number of transcription start sites which then means the activity of the RNA polymerase varies between them. And so to kind of keep the simulations more comparable um, to an experimental observable, which would be the uh, active RNA P fraction, I'm setting the K on based on that. An interesting kind of result of that is I actually then get K ons from the simulations that I can compare. Um, I don't have any literature comparisons here um, as I'm kind of continuing to do that work. But what's interesting here is we get an order of magnitude difference between the K on depending on the transcription unit architecture. So what I would like to do kind of with this is see if experimentally is this observed and does this maybe um, hint at one or the other is in better agreement with the observed K on and that maybe makes more of an argument to use that transcription unit architecture within the simulations. And then the last kind of point I wanna make is that the number of messengers varies between them. What you'll notice is the single gene tends to have more uh, messengers, but I'll caveat that based on the fact that in the case where I have degradation and translation, that is also gonna modulate the mRNA numbers and that is not as fine tuned. So I've turned that off in this last uh, two columns. And what you'll notice is yes, there's a order of, uh, or there's a factor of three difference between the total number of messengers. What's actually interesting is the average number of genes per TU is about three. So if you were to multiply this number by three, you're actually getting about the same number of messengers with not as many um, transcription events occurring um, due to the fact that your RNA polymerase is not binding to the DNA as frequently, but when it binds to the DNA, it is generating more um, genetic information per binding event. You can think of it that way in, these mo in this model. And then in this next slide, I'm just showing kind of the traces of the mRNA uh, between those two simulations, just so you can kind of see it graphically, and I'm not just kind of making um, the numbers up. The last thing I want to touch on um, in the model is actually something kind of interesting, um, that the transcription unit expression actually evolves uh, transcriptional patterns that we observed in the Oxford nanopore. 
So what I'm showing here is the DCW operon. Um, and what I really want you to just pay attention to is the sequencing depth. You can just think that as the transcriptional activity of a region. And what you'll notice the transcriptional activity kind of decreases as you go um, to the right. Um, so that would be towards the three prime end, um, or I guess, I guess five prime end if you're looking at how it's transcribed. That's slightly, basically to the right is the simplest way to look at that. And what you'll notice in this plot here, where I'm looking at the relative mRNA copy number, if you look at the single gene event, where all of the probabilities of binding to any of these genes are exactly the same, your relative copy number of mRNA is pretty much um, equivalent. They're all about one, um, their relative abundance. Whereas if I look at it in the transcription unit uh, version, so where I'm doing multiple um, expression of genes or multi-gene expression, I should say, you'll notice that it actually follows kind of this pattern of 520 is the most expressed and then expression kind of decreases as you go down. And the reason for that is the number of transcription units that a gene is in will dictate its probability or how likely or how many events there are that uh, that gene can be uh, evolved. So in this case, 520, every single one of these greens is a uh, transcription start site. And so each one of these would represent a transcription event that would have the RNA polymerase going um, to the left, and all of that would generate uh, gene 520. Um, and so with that, I'd like to conclude, and kind of the two concluding remarks I would like to make with this is that stochastic, or I'm sorry, did it again. Stoichiometric uh, gene expression, while it is stochastic, it is a pivotal um, function of all cellular life and how it is uh, exactly achieved is unknown. I don't believe it's gonna be a one answer for um, one protein or one complex, or in the case of the DCW operon, um, those uh, proteins that work in tandem. Um, I think it'll kind of vary depending on the region of the genome, but I think it's one of those things that uh, using the transcription units, and that's kind of the second point, seems to, um, achieve uh, that kind of transcriptional activity that's observed in experiment without the addition of like adding probability factors to maybe make a gene be transcribed um, more. And then kind of the future direction, some of this stuff is uh, work that's actually been done um, or is uh, currently being done is to try and improve uh, the translation and degradation um, kinetics. So again, I'm using the same binding rate for um, the, these two events. And we know that between the different systems, there's different abundances of mRNA and just RNA in general, and that's gonna change um, the observed kinetics um, if those rates are the same. Um, the effect of DNA replication is something I wanna take into account. Uh, basically, as Ben kind of alluded to, where you have a chromosome replicating, there's more genes, that's more uh, possible transcription events that could be occurring. Um, incorporate some of the transcription, or I'm sorry, incorporate some of the transcriptomic data to parameterize the model a little bit more based on the um, observed uh, expression levels. Uh, what I was kind of showing, the numbers aren't really important, it's more the trends. Um, I know I'm not expressing the, I'm not generating the amount of RNA I maybe would expect to. What I'm more so trying to look at is what the impact of the architecture is on uh, the observed ex expression pattern. The, uh, another thing that could be added is co-transcriptional processing. So we know that some of these events can actually happen while the gene is being transcribed. And then the last kind of three points are somewhat lumped together is examine stoichiometries and gene expression and see the impact on complexation. So when we start to actually form these complexes, which we have mechanisms to do that and mo a model to do that, how does the expression, depending on the transcription unit architecture, um, modify? the complexation uh, efficiency that you see in the cell. That'll be better done in spatial simulations. And then this kind of last point is I would like to adapt this to Florum and SIN uh, 1.0. I kind of have it adapted to Florum um, already and SIN 1 to some extent, but there's a little bit of complications with some of the parameters uh, for SIN 1. And then Florum, I'm just trying to verify some things. So I'm not as familiar uh, with that system. And so with that, I would like to thank my group all of you for listening. Um, the experimental collaborators at the JCVI and John Glass, especially uh, Angad Mehta and his um, student, and then as well as uh, Pratap Vampali and Christopher Fields for their discussions.